Good afternoon, all you young folks out there and all of our members of the Judicial Council and our advisors, welcome. I'm Michael Pritchard, your MC, with my good friend, Derek Beverly. We are so excited to have California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber here with us today. Dr. Weber was nominated by Governor Gavin Newsom and sworn in on January 29th, 2021, as California's first Black Secretary of State. Dr. Weber's drive for activism and legislative work stems from her family's experience in the Jim Crow South as sharecroppers. Having taught at multiple California institutions of higher education, Secretary Weber has served four terms as an assembly member representing the 79th district. She's been a chair of both the Legislative Black Caucus and the San Diego Unified School District and served twice as a California elector. She's fought to secure and expand civil rights for all Californians, including those who have formerly been incarcerated. Dr. Weber's passion has driven her to equity-oriented le legislative policies, which include school finance and accountability, classroom safety, ethnic studies, attendance and dropout rates, law enforcement's use of force, inclusive jury selection and instruction, and restorative justice, and many other important causes. And with that, please give a warm welcome to Madam Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard. And thanks to all of you for having invited me to be a part of this today. Um, you know, I love to talking in person uh, because I get the, the energy and the vibes from the people in the room. So I've adapted in the last uh, year to talking over Zoom and still hoping to see the, the faces of those who are listening uh, to give me feedback as to whether or not they're enjoying what I'm saying and whether or not I'm reaching them in that sense. But I'm honored to be with you today. I mean, I um, when I was thinking, as I was talking before the program, I said, you know, I'm more intrigued by your stories than necessarily by my own, uh, that I understand the challenges that you face uh, and have lived through some of those challenges uh, in terms of my own personal life, but surely in terms of the lives of the students that I have worked with for over 40 years uh, as a professor, as a community activist, as a school board member, and 50 years as a, in terms of as a legislator, being seeing the issues that you brought to my table, that you brought to my office and to my desk, uh, the things that we've tried to wrestle with and the, and the battles that I've attempted to fight and some of the victories that we've won uh, on your behalf and on behalf of the people of California. Let me tell you a little bit about who I am because oftentimes people read my resume and you heard a little bit of it. They read my resume and they go, wow, this is a woman who went to UCLA, got three degrees and had her PhD by the age of 26. She must be really, really smart. <laughs> That's what people say. She must have had a really boring, highly focused life. The only thing she did was go to school. And that was kind of almost right to a certain extent. Uh, I, and, and I became a professor at the university at the age of 23. I think probably the youngest professor at San Diego State University that had was on tenure track in terms of a permanent faculty member. And I was instrumental in the development of ethnic studies, Africana studies and working with Chicano studies and Native American studies uh, and women's studies uh, during the time I was a professor at San Diego State. But, um, but you know, I'm a kid who was a, um, uh, whose parents were sharecroppers uh, from Hope, Arkansas. And it's important to understand that because being a sharecropper meant that you were probably a half step above a slave. You were a legit, legit, legitimized kind of freed slave to a certain extent. And, and, and some of you may know what sharecropping is and others may not. But when slavery ended in, in 1865, uh, landowners tried to develop a system that would continue to keep people subservient. And one of those systems was called sharecropping. And on the surface, it sounded good that you, know, you could work somebody else's land and, and, and till that land and, and harvest those crops. And then you would share in the profit, you would share in the profit. But what happened during that time frame is that um, uh, you'd be given a little shack to live and you'd work that land. And, uh, and in the interim during the year, you had to have food, you had to have clothes, you had to have something. And so at the end of the, the season, when the crop was due and you felt you were gonna get some money, what would happen is they'd come back and say, well, you know, you gotta pay for the shack I let you sleep in 
You got to pay for the seeds. You got to pay for the food that we gave you, the flour that you charge at the store and the little bit of meat that you got. And so in the end, when they added up the bill and they were the only ones who kept the records, when they added up the bill, you were still in debt. And so they say, well, don't worry about it. We'll just roll that over to the next year. And so it kept rolling over. And so you ended up being indebted to these, these individuals, working, basically getting no money from it, not being able to develop your own uh, lifestyle. And as a result, you were encaptured into this system for the rest of your life. And the reality was that then they had this debtors kind of prison thing. If you didn't pay, you could be thrown into prison. But in addition to that, your son and your, 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 your descendants, your sons, your children, all of them inherited your debt when you died. So that if for some reason you worked your whole life as a sharecropper, you died, that debt would be carried over to your children and to your, your family. And so a lot of men ran away from the South because of the fact that their parents wanted them to leave because they knew that they would be uh, indebted for this debt for the rest of their lives. And so you, you have examples of people leaving the South uh, because they would be indebted. Well, my father was a sharecropper, but he was in, unusual in the sense that his family owned land and that they could, they, could, they could basically work their own land, but they would never be allowed to work their land unless they first worked somebody's whites land. That they had to continue to, to pay, kind of be servants to, to whites. And if they didn't work white people's land, they would not be allowed to buy things in the store. They would not be allowed to get seeds to, to put into the land for their own. They may find that their animals might have been killed or whatever it may be. And so they were forced to work other people's land as well as their own. Well, my father was a sharecropper and he was very proud as sharecropper. And as a result of that, he got into a confrontation about how much money they owed him because he knew he had, they owed him more, that his, 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 his products weighed more than they said at the way station. And he was constantly in conflict with them. And so as a result, he became a liability and they were going to kill my father. They were had planned to um, do a night ride to our home to kill my father. And as an example to everybody else in the town that this is not something was expected of, of African-Americans. And so my father then had to leave in the middle of the night uh, being uh, taken by his family to another town, put on a train and shipped off to Los Angeles to be with my mother's mother. Uh, three months later, uh, my dad had worked and saved enough money that, my, my, that, me, uh, that me along with my other five brothers and sisters and my mother got on a train once again late at night to basically slip out of Arkansas and to come to California. So, so, my, so my history is steeped in, in this whole reality that my father had a very limited education, uh, barely could read, very limited opportunity in the South, but he was determined that his kids would have a better way. And so as a result, uh, he came to California, uh, got a job, worked very, very hard all of his life uh, in, in the steel mills of Los Angeles, and, um, and basically took care of his, at that time, at, at some point, there were two more kids born, the eight kids and his wife, uh, and we lived in the projects. We eventually moved to the projects. So I lived in a place that you probably see on television where there's lots of poverty, uh, limited opportunity. There was a school in the neighborhood, but not a whole lot of recreational activities, those kinds of things. There were gangs in our community uh, that were there. Uh, and yet we were unusual to the extent that we had two parents in the household, my mother and father, who had very tight reins on us about uh, being in the house at a certain time, making sure that we we did our work, that we worked hard, and that we uh, tried our best to, to not to be overly influenced by the, the environment around us. And that really was probably the saving part of my life that I had family, parents who cared deeply about uh, the conditions under which their children live, and a grandmother and, and an uncle who was responsible for bringing us to California, um, who also cared very deeply for, for the family and for us and making sure that we had some sense of of family and, uh, and participation and ownership. Um, eventually my father was able to purchase some land in, Lo in Los Angeles only on a fluke again because his company folded that he was working for and they gave him uh, the retirement money that he put in. And so he was able to buy a house in, in Los Angeles and grew from that. So my life was often um, per as precarious as most folks, you know, you, you live from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you live to pay your bills and your gas and light. You try to make a life for yourself in, in that sense. But, but key to all of that became uh, the teachers that I had in my school and the belief that those teachers had that I could become something, that I could be somebody, that I could um, rise above the conditions. And it was interesting because it was right at the beginning when 
a lot of uh, teachers from, our, from, from the South were coming to California. And so my entire elementary school was all African-American teachers. They did not allow, at that time, teach, teachers of color to teach other students. And it was interesting because in that sense, it actually worked as an advantage because those per people were, uh, were really a no-nonsense teachers who made sure that we had uh, resources, that we were uh, doing our work, that we were competitive with other kids. And they, they made sure of that because they, they constantly informed us that they understood what was happening in the world, that the world was not fair, that it was not just, but that we had to rise above that. And that in spite of that, those kinds of things, we could fight those things, but while we're fighting those things, we also have to stay focused on the work that we had to do. And so as a kid growing up in the projects and eventually moving to 45th Street and going to school in South Central LA, uh, I was constantly surrounded and reminded by individuals the tremendous amount of, of effort and work that was gonna take for me to be successful. But in addition to that, people always said, despite how hard it's gonna be, you can still do it. And that, and that was important because I went to a church that told me the same thing. I lived in a neighborhood where people were struggling, but always believing that, that kids who wanted to get out could get out. And we fought very hard to make sure that that, that took place. So I came out of a tradition of, of hard work, um, difficult times, um, <clears throat> never had family, never had a savings account. I <laughs> didn't know how I was going to get to college, uh, but we, but they never believed that I couldn't, you know, that, that, that we couldn't do things, that, that we had to, to move forward, that we had to keep pushing and pushing. And, uh, and central to that was also a belief that, that, uh, that, that there's some value in life that you, that's important for you and that you are known by the values and the things that you believe in. And I, and, and I want to, uh, you know, and so with all of that, you know, I, I had a, a life that took me from the inner city to UCLA, uh, from UCLA uh, to work at some universities in Los Angeles, but then eventually to San Diego State University. And from that, from one issue to the next, moving forward. But central to all of that was some, some driving other elements in my life. You know, as I told you, there were always these people who believed in me. And that's why it's important that you, that you gravitate to people who are positive, who believe in you, not those who, who accept the conditions in which you exist, but who believe you can rise above it. And sometimes they were older people, sometimes they were young people, sometimes they were my peers who said, Shirley, you know, you're smarter than most of us. Uh, do something with your life, make something of yourself, and we'll be really proud of you. And, and people kept saying, you can do something and, and don't allow yourself to become the environment in which you live, but change the environment in which you live to become who you want to be. And so I, I kind of live with that thought every day that, that, I that I could be better than what, I, than what I was given in terms of life, in terms of resources, that I could amass more resources if I really worked hard. But equally important, I also understood every day that the, that the, that the odds were against me, that the obstacles were gonna be hard and that it would be difficult for me to, to basically work my way out of this situation. Because why the system is so programmed and planned against it. It's like, um, you know, it's like going to a school and, and, and I, I've seen this when I was on the school board and, and kids thinking that they're doing really, really well in school. And they come to the university where I am as a professor and discover that in their Spanish class, they only did half the book when they were supposed to do the whole book, okay? No fault of their own, but these were low expectations that people had of them. And so as a result, they couldn't uh, take the Spanish test and, and enter that level. They became frustrated with that. No one really taught them well how to write, but they, but they, but they could have if they'd had the curriculum. And so it became a real challenge when I was a university professor because I knew that the, the challenges faced by these young people was not the fact that they weren't smart enough, that they didn't know it, but they didn't have access to the resources. There was no one there to push them forward. There was no one there to really help them. And they didn't know where to find those resources. And so as the, when, by the time they got to university, I became the resource to help them figure out how to write uh, classroom papers or how to navigate the university system uh, and to make di a difference for themselves. How to basically deal with these issues of inequality in, in a way that was productive, that would basically produce some results rather than dealing with it in a way that only frustrated them and moved and didn't move them forward. And so it became significant that, that I, as one of the faculty at the university, began to deal with the issues that were there. 
You know, when I was a kid, I grew up with some very uh, basic principles. And one, you know, that your word is your bond, that whatever you say, and that's kind of a, a, a thing of the streets too, that whatever you say, people ought to believe you, that what you say, your word is your bond. And I say that to you as you're trying to figure out how you're going to navigate this world, how you're going to make a difference. Keep in mind that your word is your bond, that it, that's who you are. And if you if you make promises, if you make expectations, if you if you give somebody your word that you're going to do something, put all your energy into making it happen because that is what will in the end sustain you. You know, when I have um, you know, you you read in my resume that some of the legislation I've done, I've done some very difficult legislation, legislation that people did not believe could ever take place, like changing the use of force, lethal force the reparations bill. And it goes on and on with all of these things that I did to change, to try to impact what was happening in the streets and what was happening in the communities and the lives of young people being killed and so forth and so on. But a lot of that legislation not only came from community groups like yours that brought bills to me to because they believed I would, I would do my very best to shepherd it through the process of legislation and that I would not give up and I wouldn't compromise and I wouldn't cop out on people and I wouldn't sell them out because they knew my word, that my word was my bond. If I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna try to do it. And you can rest assured that I would not be using you to do something else. And so it becomes important that, that they trusted me. But in addition to their trust, my colleagues trusted me, the people in the assembly, that when I, would went, I went to them and said, this is what I'm trying to do. These are the obstacles I face. This is the challenge I face. It was interesting that they believed me. And I remember a couple of times when law enforcement with the police, because normally you don't win bills with the police, they win every, every bill. And uh, when I was doing the lethal, lethal force bill, they would, they would say things like, well, we've tried to talk to her and she's being unreasonable. My colleagues will say to, would say to them, Dr. Weber is not an unreasonable woman. And she said, she's trying to talk to you folks and you refuse to talk to her. And so they believed me over the others where before they would not have believed members of this would have been a easy, easy way for them to go out. They would say, no, she keeps saying she's trying to negotiate. She's trying to make this happen. You need to talk to her. And so they believed me over others. And this was not only Democrats, this was also Republicans who said the same thing, whether they believed they were gonna vote with me or not. They said, no, Dr. Weber's not an, 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 an unhonorable woman. And, and, and they spent a million dollars trying to vilify me and try to attack me publicly and all kinds of things. And they never could because my word was my bond. It was, my, it was who I was. And so it becomes important that you recognize the fact that people will respect you, even if they disagree with you, even if they decide that this is not something they wanna do, they cannot say that this is a dishonorable person. They can't say, well, she says this today, but she'll do something else tomorrow. Your word is your bond. Your word is your bond. The other thing I learned as a kid, as I, um, uh, as I, as I, I navigated the streets of Los Angeles, I walked by this place every day on the way to high school. And there'd be this building sitting on the corner, and there was a picture of Africa in it. And I never saw anybody go in or out of that building. But it's interesting how somehow words can impact you. Uh, this there was a statement that that, uh, that was on there that says, "Never forget." from whence you've come. Never forget from whence you've come. And every day I walked by that sign, every day that I went to high school, and it, and it was on Vernon Avenue, and I think maybe on Hooper, Hoover, Hoover somewhere, but I walked by that building every day, and that sign was there that says, uh, never forget from whence you've come. And I took that, and, and I soaked it in, in my life as I, as I tried to as I navigated high school and went on to UCLA, and you know, you can get caught up in the beauties of the UCLA's and the bushes and the trees and the wealth and all that kind of stuff, but I never forgot from whence I had come. I never forgot the neighborhood that I grew up in. I never forgot the people at that church that helped and supported me. I never forgot people who, who, who gave me small things or who just gave me a word of encouragement. I never forgot from whence I come. Because I realized that wherever I was, but for the grace of God, I could have been somewhere else. That some of my friends who didn't make it out, didn't make it, it was not because they didn't try hard enough. They didn't, it's not because they didn't deserve more than me. 
uh, it was sometimes circumstances of life that are difficult, that are hard, that, are, that make it almost impossible and, and things just don't fall in the right direction. And so I never forgot from whence I've come. I never forgot that I was a poor kid uh, in Los Angeles, that I could not afford to ride the bus to school every day, that I took lunch to school every day because I couldn't afford the cafeteria. And that was before free and reduced lunch. And if it had been, I would have been one of those kids on free and reduced lunch. But I never forgot from whence I came. I never forgot the fact that people invested in me because they believed I was going to do something great for them in the end, that I was going to represent the community well, that I was going to basically take their challenge and their issues and move them forward. And so I, I, I kept that in my mind and in my heart. And, and, and I never moved out of the community. I never, you know, despite whatever resources, my husband was a judge, I was a professor, I never moved out of the community. I always lived in a community where there were people who were hardworking, who were poor, who not those who owned big businesses and corporations, but who had small houses or places they invest in, who did everyday work like my dad. I wanted to be there because I felt as long as I'm there, my heart will be there, my work will be there, my perseverance will be there. And so I've always lived in the, in the neighborhood, as folks would say, I've always lived in the neighborhood, never wanted to live anywhere else. And even when I built a house, I built a house in the neighborhood. Why? Because I wanted young people to see that there could be people who were successful, who had worked hard, who had invested in, a whole, in the community and who still found value in living next door to them felt value that they could do something and that they could be a role model in whatever it was. I remember once when um, there was a kid when I was living in my other house in, in this community, um, uh, a kid knocked on my door. He was my newspaper guy and, and, and he knocked on my door and there was a, another kid standing there with him and he goes, aren't you a doctor? Don't, don't, aren't you a doctor? And I said, yeah, I'm Dr. Weber. He goes, and then your husband, a, a lawyer, a judge or something, he said, I said, yeah. And he turned to his friend and said, I told you, and they walked away. And it was so funny because, because it was like he was saying, I told you these kind of people live in my neighborhood. I'd throw them paper, you know, I know them. And it was really quite funny, but, but I watched this kid who was so diligent about throwing papers. And I reminded me of my brother who had a paper route that, that really was so fundamental to his life. And, and then I watched the kid go from a bike to a little moped, and from something else and eventually become a student at San Diego State University because he knew I worked there. But it was like me living in his neighborhood meant something to him because he stood there and said, I told you so to his friend and they walked away. And it was all he wanted to do was validate evidently a story he had been telling everybody at his school that in our neighborhood is this woman who's a doctor at the university and her husband is a lawyer and they live in the neighborhood around the corner from him. And so, it's that kind of, um, of reality that, that I always felt that, you know, that at some point I want, to, I, 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 I want to never forget from whence I've come, never forget the struggles that folks have. And because as, as a result of that, it makes me a stronger advocate for voting rights. It makes me a stronger advocate for social justice. It makes me an advocate that keeps pushing the issue and the envelope that yes, those on parole must vote. That was one of our bills and that got to the, got to the ballot last year. Now we have enfranchised, created voting rights for over 50 some a thousand additional individuals who are probably black and mostly black and brown who are on parole. I mean, these things are critical in our community. And if those of us who have been given the benefit and the opportunity to, to move to a different level or to be exposed to different things or to just to have the power to make it happen. If we can basically carry that agenda forward and become advocates for that community, because why we understand so critically how it is that when you can't vote or when you're denied the right to vote and the impact it has on your life and your options, it becomes critical that we're able to do that. So I live by that principle that never forget from whence I've come. You'll never forget from whence I've come. And when I graduated from high school, a, uh, a friend of ours who was an English teacher at our church gave me this card, and I have it to this day, and that's been, what, maybe 50 years ago, over 50 years ago, and, uh, it, and, it, and it did the diagram, the grammatic diagram of it, and it basically diagrammed out the statement that's, that came from, Aaron, uh, from, uh, uh, from Hamlet that says, above all things, to thine own self be true. Above all things, to thine own self be true. And that is so critically important that we live by our values and that we're not afraid to stand up and have the courage to live those values. Maya Angelou said that you can't have values that you live by every day unless you have courage. 
unless you have the courage of your conviction. And because someone's going to challenge what you believe in, they're going to challenge your principles, they're going to try to make you wibble wobble on those principles. And I can tell you, I am challenged by that each and every day when people try to get me to do things that I don't believe in, try to get me to do things that I know have a negative effect, try to get me to do things that in my mind would be detrimental for not only me, but for my grandkids and my kids who look to me to be kind of a force of the rock in terms of values and principles and how I treat people and how and what I think about life. And it says, above all things, to thine own self be true. And, and, and I can say that I can, not that I'm perfect by any stretch of the imagination and have not always done the right things, but I can say that, I, that in most cases I have done, I've tried to stand firm on the principles that I believe in and try to do the right things, regardless of the consequences that it may mean for me, whether I get elected or don't get elected, uh, those kinds of things. I've tried to stand firm on those principles because I want to be true to myself and I want to basically be true to those who've invested in me. Um, so I, and you know, so this is this is my brief journey. I'm now at the Secretary of State, which is a, a tremendous position. And I have to let you know that it was not a position that I'd ever thought in my life I would ever aspire to become. You know, those uh, positions I've had as a school board member and as an assembly member and now Secretary of State, these were not on my life agenda. I can tell you that. I had planned to be just a basic high school teacher and live my whole life impacting the lives of high school students. Uh, but I had a friend, I had a professor who believed in me, who thought I should be a Woodrow Wilson fellow, which is one of the highest fellows that you can have. And I thought, I'm just a poor kid out of South Central LA who struggled at UCLA for the first year or so, because it was so difficult and so foreign to me. And uh, here was this professor saying, no, you could be a Woodrow Wilson fellow. And when I graduated from UCLA, there were over 6,000 graduates and there were 17 Woodrow Wilson fellows. And, uh, and that meant that you become a university professor. So it opened up opportunities and grants and things for me to do that. And, um, and so I, you know, so as I look at these challenges, I thought, well, that's great. That's as great as I'm going to get on be a university professor. So when I was asked to run for these offices, I was really shocked that I was asked to run for office. Uh, and, uh, and, that, and people said, no, you're going to be a great legislator because you have courage and you can do this and your voice, your voice for so many. And so I took on that challenge and it was great. And I've made my mark in terms of legislation and was very content with the fact that I probably had about three years left before I'd be termed out. And had it not been for the governor and some others saying, you know what, as people were looking for a secretary of state and I was not applying, <laughs> you know, someone said, I think Dr. Weber would be a good secretary of state because she's got courage. She's got, she, her word is her bond and she will fight for the rights to vote for every Californian and every person across this nation. And I was shocked at that, that the offer was made. But I was honored because I realized that my father had fought for the right to vote. And here it was some years later that when he had been denied the opportunity to vote in the South, that his daughter would be the person who was ensuring the vote of 40 million Californians, the largest state in the union, the fifth largest economy in the world. I mean, that in itself would have been a dream come true if my dad were alive, to know that his work and his hard work and his vision for his family uh, was manifested in so many different ways with my brothers and sisters but obviously manifested in my, my ascension to the Secretary of State and representing the state of California. So I wanna thank you guys for inviting me today. I appreciate the work that you've done. You're, you're, you're champions for social justice and that is not an easy thing to be. It's not an easy thing to do. And oftentimes there's so many people, interestingly enough, who fight against the restorative justice, who fight against uh, giving people a second chance, who believe that, that once you made a mistake, it should never, it should mar you forever. And there should be no way that we should ever go back and bring you forward. And, uh, and it's always interesting to me that people believe that, or at least they say that in public policy. And yet when it affects their family, they immediately believe in social justice and restorative justice. They believe in bringing their own family members back. And I look at everyone as being a member of a family that we all make mistakes, we all fall down. And it's not the falling down that's the problem. It's the getting up and the restoring ourselves and basically learning from our mistakes and then helping others to do likewise. If, there, if there's any person who's never made a mistake in life, I'd like to know who they are. If anyone has never done something that we, 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 that we uh, are happy people don't know about, uh, that's all of us. Uh, and that we basically have, we believe in second chances and third chances and fourth chances. I mean, as long as a person wants to struggle to bring their life back, we must give them a chance to do so. Uh, I'm a very religious person, and I know at one point when they were asked by Jesus, you know, should we, if a person asks for forgiveness, uh, should we, should we uh, forgive them seven times seven? And he said 70 times seven. 
which means there should be a never ending spirit of forgiveness, cooperation, collaboration, and bringing folks back and helping people to figure out how to have restorative justice and how to have justice and how to reconstruct their lives in a way that's productive and beneficial to all of us. So once again, thank you so very much for having me with you this morning. I'm not sure what the agenda is at this point, whether you're gonna have questions and answers, I'm more than happy to do that for any of those who are in the audience and who are listening. So we have a few questions. Um, you talked a little about restorative justice and your advocacy for restorative justice when you were in the California legislature is truly remarkable. And I was wondering what interested you in restorative justice? Well, you know, a couple of things. One, um, when I was on the school board, uh, we began a restorative justice project because uh, we came to understand that what we were doing was ineffective and that simply punishing folks did not make it better, it made it worse. When I became a part of the legislature, I realized that, uh, that our recidivism rate was extremely high and that we had the largest prison system in the world. And, uh, and, 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 and all it did was destroy people's lives and destroy families each and every day. And that we had to do better. And so I became a part of a committee that basically started looking at that because, uh, you know, some looked at it strictly as a financial issue because the prison system was breaking the back of California. Uh, we had so many, we were paying so much and getting so little in return and no one felt safer. No one felt better as a result of the system that we had. And clearly we had tr tremendous opposition for anyone from those who, who wanted to restore individuals. Um, and, and in fact, I remember when we changed the title of the, uh, the CDC uh, to, uh, for, from the California Direction uh, Compartment Department to, um, to the California Direction and Rehabilitation, we got, we got pushback. People said didn't want to do rehabilitation. Uh, they didn't want to restore individuals' lives and help people while they were incarcerated to get better and then to help them when they got out. Because why? It, it provided a source of income. Uh, that we kept growing and growing the, this prison system and constructing prisons and creating jobs around prisons rather than restoring people's lives. So it was clear to me that uh, people deserve more than the first chance, the second and third chance, that we had to do whatever was necessary to teach folks how to deal with their anger, with their poor decision-making, whatever it may be, uh, that we had a responsibility incarcerating people to make their lives better. Um, when I traveled around the world, I realized that no one else did uh, incarceration in the way we did. That was not, that was a free country, but everyone believed in restorative justice. Everyone believed that young people who, who needed a chance had a chance. And I went to some uh, rehabilitation facilities in Ghana and much of their focus was trying to restore the family, not just the child, but the whole family. And, uh, and so I realized we were on, uh, not only early on and in, in, in when I was dealing with schools, but surely at the state level that we were truly in going in the wrong direction with regards to car, in, uh, with rehabilitation and restorative justice, and that we had to improve. Otherwise, we were going to destroy ourselves with incarceration growing and growing, and no one feels safer, and basically it, it devouring and eating up a, a, a civilized system. So uh, when I got on the legislature, there were 180,000 uh, people in prison. I think there's less than 90 now, and about 90,000, we've cut it in half. We uh, were closing one of the prisons. We pretty much dealt with, with a lot of the prisons that dealt with young people, uh, putting them close, uh, any kind of facility of rehabilitation closer to home to try to, to bring families back together. And we're still working on that project to make it happen. But um, we, we, we have to restore people. We cannot destroy lives because once you, once you destroy one life, it's not just that person. It's the person, his wife, the children that he's had, the family, all these kinds of things break down. And so uh, I be it became real clear to me that we had to work very hard uh, on restorative justice because without that as a society, we were crumbling. Thank you, Secretary Weber. Another question is, um, you've talked about your time as an educator and I think that education is such an important part of community, which you've also spoken about. Do you think that our education system is working well? And if there's room for improvement, what do you think that will require? Is it working well? No. Is there room for improvement? A whole lot. No question. Um, and most folks know that I, I have been an advocate for changing our educational system, uh, making sure that there's accountability for, for what takes place in the classroom, making sure that we are able to put our our, our, um, to deal with our teaching staff to make sure that we put our most effective teachers in those schools with the greatest challenge. Um, making sure that every school is the same, that it has the same level of, of, of expectation and drive and, 
and those kinds of things, rather than knowing that there's some schools that work and some that don't. Um, we, our, you know, our system is based right now on economics, that the, the better neighborhoods, kids have the greater results that come out of it. And it's frustrating because um, I've, uh, I've seen some teachers work very, very hard and they're frustrated because, you know, your first and second grade teacher is great and then nobody cares what happens in third grade. And so we have this gap of, of excellence that exists and it has its, and then we begin to see the impact when kids get into fifth and sixth grade. So we have a lot to do in terms of education. And it's, and it's, and it's very personal to me because as I pointed out, I went to school in the projects in the Pueblos and my teachers had high expectations of me, but not only high expectations, but high level of support that they were there. And I've seen some teachers and counselors who do that today that uh, it doesn't matter what the kids need, they're gonna figure out how to get it for them. That are gonna create opportunities for them. They're gonna expand their world. And that's what my teachers did. You know, I, being in the projects in, in the Pueblos, um, everybody was poor. And yet I knew more about going to the opera than many other kids because our teachers and, and the school worked to get the tickets to the opera for us. We went to the ballet. Uh, we had all of these, this exposure to the outside world. That others, that others were having, that people didn't believe that just because we were poor, we should not have it. Um, I have some friends who work in some of our schools who, who do that. And uh, for instance, if, if, I'm, if I'm buying a table uh, for dinner for $5,000 or whatever it may be, I will be at that table maybe with one other friend, but then I have my girlfriend bring eight other kids from her school to that dinner. Because I want them to see what the world happens, what the world looks like, how the world lives. And it's been interesting that the things that we've done with them have motivated those kids to say, you know, I want to be like Dr. Weber. I want to be able to have a house that has a glass bowl for uh, in her bathroom. One woman came out and said, I'm going to go to college so I can get me a glass bowl in my bathroom. When I, I said, this bowl only costs about $150, but that's okay. If that motivates you to go to college, I'll buy you the bowl when you get your house. I mean, you know, it's that kind of thing that an exposure to the world, coming to the university when I was there, bringing kids to the university, and many of them didn't know the university was less than four or five miles from their home, but it was like a foreign land to them. We have to, we have to begin to provide the kind of education that motivates and stimulates our kids and opens the horizons for them so they can see the world. I took kids to South Africa who had never been on a plane before. Uh, but they travel with me to South Africa and it changed their lives. They went off to college, they've done well. And these are kids who've never been on a plane, but they got a chance to travel and see that life is bigger than the spot in the corner in which they live. And they had teachers who believed in them. So we really have to look at this educational system. Education is the American equalizer. It was in my life. It, it has the potential to equalize the situation so that you can then compete <clears throat> to have more resources, to build a better home. Uh, environment for yourself, where without it, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible. So we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do in our schools. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Um, moving on, I wanted to address that throughout your work, you've taken positions that were not the party line or may have been politically risky. So how do you navigate speaking your truth and navigating difficult situations? You know, it's one of the things is that if people know you're gonna tell the truth, they kind of expect it. And then like people say, if you say, uh, I don't do drugs, I don't do drugs, eventually people stop offering you drugs, okay? Because they know it's a waste of time, let's go find someone else. Um, if you always have the truth and people know what you believe in, uh, they're gonna seek you out for the truth. And they're gonna respect the fact that you're gonna tell the truth and not try to change you in terms of the truth. Um, your community needs to know that. And I've had, uh, I've had years of, of fighting for issues that are important. Uh, I just got a letter from a young kid from 31 years ago who tells me somehow or another I inspired her, him, her to do certain kinds of things. Uh, it's important that people uh, know you so that when, when you're confronted with these challenges, when you're confronted with um, uh, where you're gonna stand, People know that where you stand is a stand of principles, that it's, that it's not designed to gain you anything, that you're not going to get something on it. You're not selling somebody out. And as a result of that, they will invest in you and they will protect you. And so when I've done these things and these, these things that people say, oh, my God, you're courageous, you're this, you're that, I have had also the support of, of my community, of the churches that I've attended, the people that I've helped who know what my heart is all about and what I want to do. And they stand behind me and they stand with me. 
And so, you know, like I said, I've had folks spend a million dollars trying to destroy me on, on issues in legislation that I've been fighting for, for, for justice and equality. And, um, and I'm still standing, okay? I'm still standing. I have strong spiritual principles that guide me in terms of my values. And I always tell people, you know, I'm, I'm here for, to do the good that's necessary. And when you make that decision, I've seen it in young people. I've seen those who work with me on different issues. It will be difficult. People will challenge you. But after a while, people stop challenging you because they know that you're not weak, that you're, you're standing on some values and principles that are clear and near to you. And those are things you'll be fighting for. And so it's always interesting to me. I, I, I had an opportunity this morning to talk about some legislation that's occurring that, well, the Supreme Court uh, not the attorney general statewide is, is, is dealing with Georgia and their laws that are so repressive in terms of voting. And I think they were a little bit surprised because they had not heard me talk before of, my, of, 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 of how strongly I believe that the federal government has a right to go in there and to basically create the environment that's the right environment for everyone to be able to vote in Georgia. And, um, and that I'm passionate about it. And they say, well, you know, you could get a lot of backlash from it. You can get, I said, hey, you know what? If I'm not willing to take the positions that are important for all of the people, then I shouldn't have this job. You know, someone else should come and do it because I'm going to basically continue to fight for those things that I've always fought for, whether I'm secretary of state or not. And when this term is over, I have to live with myself above all things to thine own self be true. And I want my legacy to be the legacy that she fought towards right and just every day of her life. And so that's what you, once you commit yourself to that, you will be just fine you will discover that the things that you fear the most will be nothing to fear. Thank you, Dr. Weber. And then one more question from us. Um, what would a truly equal justice system look like to you? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, uh, probably an opposite of a lot of stuff that we have, okay? Um, it should not be a punitive system. And, and, and that was one of my battles in the legislature when we were trying to define why should people be incarcerated? And they were insisting that the number one reason they should be incarcerated for punishment. And I said, incarceration itself is a punishment. <laughs> you know, I mean, so that is not the that is not the goal of it. It is a punishment. And they didn't, and we were saying it was really for public safety and restorative justice and, and, and rehabilitation. And people didn't want to deal with the fact that while we're putting people away, it is because we want to one, create a safe place for people. But in addition to that, we also want to restore this person back. And that's why it's so very important. And so when we start talking about what would a system look like, it has to have those components. You know, when we start talking about social justice and, 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 and dealing with a system that oftentimes is most unjust, uh, we have to make sure that, that we're doing the right thing for not only the, the person who's been, a, 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 um, who's been hurt, but also the person who's done the hurt to try to build those folks together and help them to understand each other. And, 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 and because the person who's committed the crime needs to understand how they need to be restored and the damage that they've done, not just to themselves, but to other people as well. It's not a get, get out of jail free card, but it also then begins the work of how do they bring themselves back and how do they then amend or make amend for the damage they've done to others. And, and that in itself helps to restore that person back to being who we want them to, to be a responsible citizen so that they don't go around hurting people again and they understand the consequences of that. And those who've been offended, affected by it obviously understand this process that also brings them back. So it's one of these systems that we need to make sure that in the end, that we've done the best we can to, to help the person who's been offended and been hurt, but also to help that person then restore themselves back into the fold of, of what we want them to be as a good citizen, a good parent, a person who helps others, and then begin to prevent the damage that's being done elsewhere. We should see our, 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 our system as a small system rather than a huge system in society. It should be the smallest system because we should spend our time, one, trying to prevent the damage that's being done through our, our prison systems and, and the justice system, trying to prevent that from happening at the earliest possible level, and then moving forward to restore it as we go forward. We still have a society that's very punitive, uh, you know, my one of my friends was trying to uh, get a bill passed that you that you should not expel three and four year olds from preschool. I mean, who you know, and and we can't get she couldn't get this bill through because why people want to punish three and four year olds? Who in the world wants to punish a three year old? I mean, you know, uh, the kid may have issues, 
but why would you expel a child at three and four years old? You know, I was at a school where they once called the police and arrested a kid who was in the first grade, handcuffed him and put him in the back of a car. And the, and the person says, you're gonna be just like your father. That's exactly what they said to this kid who they put in the car. It was absolutely the most, one of the worst things I've ever seen. The kid was having difficulty. It was a new foster home. He was hurting because his parents had been locked up. And here you tell him he's gonna be just like his daddy and you lock him in the back of a car. That was at a school that I, uh, that I knew about. I immediately went to the superintendent and had the principal removed uh, because I knew that this was not a person to work in this community, a community where 60% or 70% of the kids were foster kids. This is not a person who needs to deal with kids who are in pain, who are struggling to create for themselves a different world and in, in, with the world in which they exist. And you're gonna lock them up, a, a first grader, that handcuff him, put him in the back of a car because he's not doing what you said that morning and send him off with the police with a statement that you're gonna be just like your father. Uh, that was totally unacceptable to me. And I don't know what happened to that kid, but I know what happened to that principal. Thank you so much for answering our questions. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna move to a couple audience questions. Uh, okay. So please raise your hand if you have any questions, the audience. I'd like to know, can felons vote in California? Yes, yes. The, the, well, first of all, felons could always vote in California since 1960 some odd. Uh, we have never had a, a law that says felons cannot vote since in, in over the last 50, 60 years. What we did do, uh, and, but not only can felons vote in California, and that was one of the bills that I passed when I first got into legislature because most people didn't even know felons could vote. And so we made it possible for them to get the materials and, and all those things as they were exiting and making sure that on their uh, parole websites that the whole idea that, that ex-felons can vote, that's number one. Uh, the other issue was parole, which we've done recently, um, that people who, are, have, who came out of prison and were on parole could not vote in California till the end of their parole. Prop 17 this past November that I was the joint author on, uh, basically now enfranchises those who are ex-felons. So anyone who is not only ex-felon, but who is on parole can vote in California. Anyone in jail can vote in California, okay? Uh, the only two, only people who cannot vote uh, are those who are incarcerated, who are physically in a state or federal prison in California. They cannot vote. And we're working to, to basically deal with that. But anyone else in California, any person you see walking the streets in California, anybody who's whatever is a citizen in California, they can vote if they're not physically sitting in a state prison or a federal prison. If they're in jail, we have people who go in jail now and who take ballots and we have some ballot boxes that are placed in jails where we have a large group of individuals who are registered to vote and they will get an absentee ballot. But yes, California, uh, if only two people, if you're not in a state or federal prison, you cannot vote in California. But other than that, everyone else can vote. Okay, any other questions? There's a question in the chat, which is what funds do you anticipate becoming <laughs> available for community-based diversion programs like youth courts? Um, you know, the interesting thing is I'm no longer a chair of the budget <laughs> in the assembly that was in charge of that. And um, so I really can't tell you exactly what's in the budget, but I do know that a part of what we were attempting to do is when, I, when, I, when I left the legislature was to, to uh, basically empower uh, uh, the community-based organizations that are working on behalf of, of, uh, of the criminal justice system to have resources to expand out. And we had done that. And I'm not sure exactly what your budget looks like, but we had done that. And I, my understanding from the chair of uh, the committee, who's I think, I think Luce Rebus is currently chair of that, of, of that particular top uh, area now. Um, 
that they're still they're, they're, they're supposed to be a hefty investment in this particular area for this budget because of the size of the budget. So my understanding, it should be good money. I can find out and check for you, but I'm not really sure because I'm not on the budget committee anymore. Yeah. Okay, well, um, this is Derek Beverly. I'm the uh, member of the board of directors to the California Association of Youth Courts and Madam Secretary, uh, 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 your words are inspiring words of wisdom. Your heart is true. Uh, I gotta admit, I fell in love with you and, and uh, uh, who you are and your commitment to society. And uh, I, I, I Hopefully everybody's going to clap uh, and uh, uh, we'd like to stay in touch with you and hear more. And if you have advice for us, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, youth courts are the tip of the spear today. I think mm -hmm. that uh, we, we try drastically to get the word out and to reconstitute youth courts in the law enforcement community with state sheriffs, district attorneys, uh, statewide. And any assistance you could provide, any direction you could provide to help us in this endeavor, I, I, we would be in debt to you forever. And I just, like I said, uh, I, I admire you beyond admiration. And I want to thank you very much on behalf of the board of directors to, uh, to hopefully we hear more from you. Well, thank you. And, and as you develop your... Um your agenda and your program, <clears throat> let me know. I, like I said, I'm not in the legislature, but I still have influence across the street and friends over there. So I'd like to make sure that you're introduced to the right people with regards to your program and the things that you're doing. And so, you know, don't hesitate to give me a call so I can, I can uh, navigate that for you uh, and to make that happen. I uh, want to also let uh, young people know that we have a number of internships in the Secretary of State's office. And uh, young people are, are encouraged to apply. Uh, you can contact my office concerning internships and all of the internships are paid. So uh, they're not only high school, but college age students who are interns in our office and learning about voting and the, and the various issues that are there. So don't hesitate to think about if some of you are interested in being an intern of contacting the Secretary of State's office. I would love to have some of you with us uh, for a semester or a year whatever the time permits as we have some vacancies that are there. So thank you, uh, count me as a friend, let me know how, how it's going and uh, we'll make sure that we reach out to the necessary folks to, to ensure uh, that they get a chance to be exposed to the program that you have and understand the work that you're doing. Thank you guys for having me with you this morning. I appreciate it so much. You made my day, thank you. You made ours, that's for definitely for sure. Take care. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, time is short and uh, uh, we've run over a little bit and hopefully have enough time to uh, uh, um, uh, introduce uh, somebody who is very near and dear to me. He's a brother by a different mother, as they say. Uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, and, and you've been listening to him uh, as our MC. But I would like to tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, Dr. Michael Pritchard, who he is, uh, what he represents, what he means to me. Um, I've known him for oh, probably well over, I want to say, 30 years. Uh, I first uh, heard him at a conference in uh, Oakland, and we became friends over the years. Um, and uh, He's an amazing, amazing person. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Pritchard. He's a nationally acclaimed keynote speaker and youth motivator. But what you don't know about him is you will you may or may not recognize some of his voices. But if any of you out there have uh, watched Star Wars, uh, Lucasfilms, uh, anything, uh, I, I, I can go on and on. Uh, Skyrocket Ranch, Disney, Fox, Toon Network. Uh, Dr. Pritchard is, uh, for those of you that don't know, he's the voice of many of the uh, characters in Star Wars. Uh, Jabba the Hutt, uh, the uh, Miwoks, the, I mean, he's the absolutely amazing guy. He, uh, 
was best friends with Robin Williams. And uh, I know knew uh, Dr. Pritchard, uh, heard of him. Uh, he's a former probation officer from San Francisco that uh, got involved in the uh, Comedy Central arena and became a uh, comic uh, uh, along with his very dear friend, uh, Robin Williams. And uh, I'd like for you to hear from Dr. Pritchard. He's a motivational youth speaker. Uh, I would encourage you, all of you, to go on his website. Um, and all you got to do is Google Michael Pritchard. You'll see all kinds of amazing stories. So with that in mind, uh, Michael, uh, uh, can you uh, speak Yoda to us or uh, something along that line? You got to go off your mute. You're muted. All right, Derek. Uh, how about if I talk for about five minutes and then later on, if the kids want to reach out to me, they can do that off the website. We're close on time. And I think the kids probably got to get on to their uh, workshops. So let me just say this to all of you. We all in the state of California love you very much and are very proud of you and your interest in restorative justice. As a young probation officer, I used to see so many neurodiverse kids who are a lot like me. And that meant that I had attention deficit disorder hyperactivity. And I was a kid who was challenged at learning, just like Dr. Weber was talking about earlier. I had many challenges in school, but I found out I was smart in another way. I did wind up at Lucasfilm standing there uh, in small rooms doing things like this. You know, can you imagine that I had attention deficit disorder? <laughs> so I think one of the things for all of us is to understand that there's so many neurodiverse uh, kids out there. And if you want to find out how that is, you can go to Dr. Fung at Stanford and study neurodiversity. You can also look up neuroplasticity, which my friend who was like Dr. Weber, a UCLA graduate, Susan Williams, the uh, wife of Robin Williams, is working on these topics now with young uh, neuroplasticity uh, experts from amazing places like, uh, you know, uh, a thing that you would see in uh, finding ways to grow your brain into new challenges and new differences. And never, as Dr. Weber was talking about, always find a new challenge and go with that and do that. One of those things is what we're doing now, finding ways to help other young people who are challenged from adverse childhood traumas and reaching out to them and helping them and assisting them in their lives, doing everything we possibly can to assist them, to uplift them in our youth court system. And if we can do that, we'll be learning not just about court, not just about what Dr. Weber talked about, neighborhoods, friends, and community. There might not be an I in team, but there is an I in community. There is an I in unity. There is an I in friends. There is an I in neighbors. All of us doing everything we can to do what we can in our neighborhood to restore people to a belief in getting past the cynicism and the sarcasm and the toxic uh, stuff that they sometimes put up on the web and finding positive, kind, thoughtful, compassionate things to do to help in those communities. We want to thank all of you for being with us today. I particularly are, uh, and, and I know my friend uh, Derek is uh, a very highly lauded and heroic FBI uh, agent who did an amazing bit of work during 9-11, a gifted man in the community, a courageous man in the community, and all of us in law enforcement and all of us in teaching and education and in social work and mental health love you, want the best for you, and hope that you find ways to help each other as you help yourselves. Thank you. If there's any questions, we can handle them on a website and you can go 
and reach me through Noah at drmichaelpritchard at gmail.com. We love you and we're grateful for you. And thank Dr. Weber and uh, Chester Bodine yesterday and Derek and uh, Judge Cousins, Judge Ir Irvin. These are folks that want the best for us in our communities. So love you guys. Take care of yourselves. Stay well. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you and uh, all that you do for the community. And we look forward to uh, your continued participation in the association. And uh, I would encourage uh, everyone listening to you today to uh, uh, go to your website, and learn more about you and who you are and what you do. And uh, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. All right, Derek. You too as well. Take care of yourself. God bless you, buddy.